Hello everyone, I'm Lucy Fanger, CEO of On Technology Partners, and I'm proud to be sponsoring our new program, Women Stars. In each episode, we will spotlight an amazing woman and the struggles and triumphs that she has faced. Then we will reflect and share her insights. Our goal is to engage, entertain, and explore the women stars in our world today. I hope you enjoy. I want to thank all of you for listening today. My name is Shanti Harkness, and I'm the media manager for On Technology Partners, a woman-owned company addressing cybersecurity and risk. Join us as we share the reflections of women just like you that have survived struggles and embraced triumphs in their lives. Today, we'll be talking with Barbara Daniel. Barbara is the publisher and editor of the Cleveland Women's Journal, a digital magazine with a mission to empower women through knowledge. Barbara was in the financial services industry for 25 years and received the Valmark Securities Award, Excellence is the Exceptional Drive to Exceed Expectations. She was the third woman president of the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. Barbara was president of the Women's City Club and received the Elsa Pavlik Award for serving as a role model. Barbara was inducted into the West Technical High School Hall of Fame, received a Women's History Month Award from the City of Cleveland, and the Inspire Award from Celebrating Women. Barbara started college at the age of 40 and graduated from Cleveland State University with a master's degree in English in 2004. Barbara is also president of the National Association of Women Business Owners Cleveland Chapter. Barbara, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. So before we begin, we'll have a little icebreaker question. Tell us something that others may not know about you or something exciting about yourself. Well, when I was a young mom, wife, secretary, I decided I wanted to be a Columbus police officer. So I think I'd been reading too many Perry Mason novels. So I really was interested in forensics and solving. So I went to the city hall to take the civil (laughs) service exam. Well, I went to a Cleveland public school, which was West Technical High School, the Cleveland public school. So I knew what a civil service exam was and I knew that it was available to everyone. Well, Columbus told me that I couldn't take the exam. Then I could only take it next year and I asked the, the clerk, I said, well, why can't I take it now? She said, well, it's only given to women every two years. And I said, well, how often is it given to men? And she said, every month. And I looked at her in disbelief and she just <laughs> didn't even blink. So uh, she said, here, write your name and contact information down and we'll call you when you're eligible. So two of my friends were detectives and they were actually waiting for me outside. So I went to them and I said, you're not going to believe this, but they won't let me take the exam because they only give it to women every two years. And that's not till next year. They go, oh, no, that's that's not right. Long story short, they introduced me to a Columbus Dispatch woman reporter. And many of us ended up on the front page of the Columbus Dispatch. We sued the city of Columbus for sex discrimination. And Columbus fought it and fought it. But good for the woman reporter and good for the Columbus Dispatch to put this kind of thing on the front page. An attorney contacted us. We had a class action lawsuit. It took us a year and a half to two years to win the lawsuit. You won if you were eligible to be a Columbus police officer. If you won, you won the lawsuit. If you could, you won the lawsuit. So I won. They called me to be on the police department because I had qualified for everything. I was pregnant. I was pregnant with my second child, and I said, well, thank you very much, but everything in my life has changed. My children are 11 years apart, so literally everything in my life had changed at that point, and I said, thank you very much, but uh, not right now. I'm pregnant, so <laughs> maybe some other time, but, but it just shows you that someone who had absolutely no power whatsoever, neither did any of the other women applying to be a police officer, we help, had other people help us to win what was obviously wrong, to disallow us to take the civil service exam. So yeah, not everybody knows that. And that was in the 70s. So really that it's a long time ago, but it really isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That <laughs> is, that's incredible. And and so great that you stood up and, and yeah. fought for what was right. Because yeah. unfortunately, so many people 
are afraid to do that or they don't know what their rights are and right. just how wonderful that that you and and that group got together and and fought for what was right yeah, thank absolutely. you so much for sharing that yeah well barbara we know that triumphs don't come without struggles right so talk to us about what some of your biggest struggles have been these can be either professionally or personally and how you were able to get through them and what kind of an impact they had on your life or career yeah we've had a lot of struggles with with the time that I have been with this magazine, we have had a lot of struggles. When I bought the magazine, it was August 2004. My dad got very ill, very, very ill. So my, my first issue was hardly anything. Certainly wasn't profitable, but I had to be with my dad. And I was in the hospital with him every day, then the nursing home every day. And he came home for a short time and then he went back, had double pneumonia and he was 89 and he couldn't recover from that. So then from then, I mean, different things. My partner was in a bad car accident. She recovered. Uh, Her daughter was a graphic designer. She had an atopic pregnancy that burst. We almost lost her. I mean, it it was like her dad passed away. And then what I thought was the worst thing that could have happened to me is I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it was triple negative breast cancer, which is a highly aggressive, it's only in 15% of women. And, you know, I chose radiation and no chemotherapy. It was stage one, had surgery and I chose radiation. You have to really do what's, what you think is best for you. When they told me what the chemotherapy would do to me, and how long I would be doing radiation plus chemotherapy and how long it would be. I had tickets to the Kentucky Derby. And this was part of my decision. I know my husband was horrified when those words came out of my mouth to the oncologist. I said, I am not missing the Kentucky Derby. (laughs) And she said, well, you go home and think about it. And then you let me know it's entirely up to you. So I had already decided I'm not having chemotherapy. I will go with radiation. I was a clinical trial because the protocol for the United States is six weeks every day. Well, I I did the clinical trial, which is Canadian and European protocol, which is three weeks of double doses. And every day is every work day, not on weekends. So I did that. And I am so grateful that I did that, that I chose to do that, that I chose not to have the chemotherapy because it was stage one and she got everything from the lymph nodes and um, from my breast. So I'm so grateful that I made that decision. And my husband and I went to the Kentucky Derby because that August, he was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. If we had not gone to the Kentucky Derby in 2014, we would never have gone. So I finished my treatment that January and there's side effects from radiation, but we were getting through it. And by, by May for the Kentucky Derby, we were feeling pretty good. And then there were, he had no symptoms, no signs at all. And it was really a death sentence. They said 18 to 24 months. So I had a photo shoot. Um, my husband passed away in 18 months. So I know when you're going through grief, but even when you're going through caregiving and it's somebody you love, especially when you know they're probably not going to survive. And, and I, I prayed he'd be part of the 5% that survived but his prognosis was pretty bad. So he passed away May 9th, which was the anniversary yesterday, five years of his passing. He passed away in 2016. I had a photo shoot for my cover two weeks after that. And my partner said, you know, I'll I'll do the photo shoot for you. And I said, you know, this is a brand new client. It's a doctor. It's It's hard to get those kind of clients. I said, I'm gonna go. It'll help me to give me something to do. I'm going to do that. It'll help me to get through. And I think that's, you know, one of the the things that you also wanted to know is how do you get through something that's difficult? You have to go through it. You can't go around it. You can't pretend it didn't happen. You can't pretend it's going to get better. You have to go through it. You have to go through every step of it in order to actually, you have to grieve. And everybody grieves differently, but you have to just go through it. So my photographer who did all my photography, when she walked in, I looked at her, I said, just don't hug me, just don't hug me and I can get through this. So we did and I was glad. He was a wonderful client. His background, he was from Ethiopia 
He started his own practice, left the Cleveland Clinic, and it was it was an amazing story. And I was so glad that I met with him. And, and it helped me. It helped me be, to be doing something productive, taking action. So I thought breast cancer was the worst, and I found out it wasn't the worst. Losing my husband was the worst thing that could have happened to me. And now we're, you know, we've had other things happen. And now, of course, COVID. But, you know, to me, everything else is just bad news or, you know, it's not tragic. It's no longer anything tragic for me. It's it's just, it's bad and something that we can get through. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and really, I think a great reminder in what you said about, you know, really having to go through the experience and, and not trying to not trying to suppress it, not trying to push it off to the side and pretend it didn't happen because, you know, I feel like that's something that a lot of people do. And I'm, I'm certainly guilty of it, you know, in the past as well. And I'm also experiencing two losses just in this past week that I'm dealing with as well. So just a great reminder for all of us, you know, to, to take that time and to grieve in whatever way we grieve but to remember that it's so important to process it, you know, as you're going through it, because if we don't deal with those things, then it's going to crop up later in different ways that we're not even necessarily going to recognize that that's what's taking place. So it's, it's definitely better for our own mental health and physical health and emotional health to, to deal with those things head on and, you know, also to reach out for support when we need it and to not be afraid to do that. So I I think that's a wonderful reminder. So I thank you for sharing that. Did you kind of along those lines, did you have any tips or tricks or methods that you used to help you through those challenging times? Yes. And I can tell you that it's okay to cry in public. I cried in public with my friends or with my family. Uh, There's triggers. Triggers will happen. A song, a location, a comment. Some there are triggers all the time, and just when you think you can't cry anymore, <clears throat> then you do because it, something triggers that grief again. I have learned not to be embarrassed about grieving, not to be embarrassed about crying in public. I'm like, oh, who cares? Who cares? That is not even important. What's important is, yes, you can cry. It is not a weakness. And it's not a weakness even now to continue to grieve in a different way. But it's okay. When you lose somebody you love, it's okay. That void is never going to be filled. That void is empty. So you find a way to get through it. What also helped me is that my husband was in hospice for 10 days before he passed away. And they offer grief counseling and it's free. So um, I'm, I'm a very strong person. I come from a very strong line of women who have had tragedies in their own lives and they're all very strong. So I knew I was strong, but I was afraid I was not handling the grief correctly. Like there's a correct way to handle grief, which of course there isn't. So I went through counseling with this woman. It was in the hospice center where my husband was. So that was hard, but it was private. And she had a box of Kleenex there and I could talk with her. And she just assured me that this is perfectly normal. I, I was afraid I was going into pity and depression and feeling so sorry for myself. And she, you know, soothed me and told me it was okay. Grieving is not being selfish. Grieving is not feeling sorry for yourself. You have a loss that you're grieving that that's okay to feel that way about it. So I went to see her for several months and then I felt, okay, a little bit stronger and that it was okay. But I also have a very strong faith and I prayed a lot. I prayed a lot for strength. I prayed for my husband every day. I prayed every day for my husband and those prayers weren't answered. But I also prayed every day for my strength, for the strength of my family. He was not the father of my children, but he was a great stepfather and a grandfather. So a lot of people had a loss his friends, a lot of people had a loss. So you have to, as I say, you have to go through it. There's no sidestepping it. You have to go through it. Yes, there's there's denial. There's um, negotiating with God. There's all these different steps. 
in the grieving process until you finally get to acceptance. And acceptance doesn't mean you've forgotten. You haven't forgotten. You will never forget that person. But it's just a different, it's a different kind of pain and a different kind of void. But you can go forward and you have to go forward because you have other people that rely on you. So you must get through it and you must go forward. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And and I think it's I think it's great that you that you took advantage of the grief counseling and and that you're, you know, so openly sharing that with us. I think that's something that unfortunately there's still a lot of stigma about reaching out for for counseling of any kind. So just that reassurance to to all of our listeners that it's okay. We all need help at some point for something and you know to to just know that it's okay to reach out for help you know whether it's short term whether it's long term whether it's for the loss of a loved one or it's stress over a job or stress in a relationship like it doesn't matter what the reason is it's okay you know to to seek out that help um so just a a great reminder and a reassurance to people so i thank you for sharing that you're welcome. And one more thing, Shanti, churches have counselors. So mm-hmm. if you belong to a church, they have wonderful counselors on all sorts of things. Also Cornerstone of Hope has, they have counselors also, they're, for, they're a bereavement organization, a nonprofit. So they have counselors at every level for every situation. So no, there's no shame in needing counseling. Absolutely. And, and a great reminder to you know, if, if you do have a religious or spiritual practice, you know, to really, you know, reach out to those in, in your church or synagogue or temple or mosque, you know, what, whatever it may be, you know, that, that spiritual community is there to help support you and to uplift you. It's great. Now let's take a moment and kind of switch things around a little bit and uh, talk more about your triumphs. What have been some of your biggest triumphs and what made them so great for you? My master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> My triumph, because as I said, I enrolled in college when I was 40. Okay. I had, I got braces when I was 40. I don't know what was going on. With me, <laughs> I was divorced and my daughter, my company moved me back to Cleveland, which is where I'm from. And I decided to enroll at Cleveland State, got braces and was dating someone. So it was just, <laughs> it was a crazy time. But during that time, so I had um, braces and in the process of my braces, I had jaw surgery, intentional broken jaw surgery, where they broke my upper jaw, pushed it back, removed bone and aligned it with my bottom jaw. Everything was completely out of alignment. Always had been, but, you know, didn't have the thought or the money to do that. So while I was in classes, I had my jaw wired shut. I had a whistle around my neck because I worked full time. I had a young daughter and I obviously couldn't yell for help when I went to school at night. So I had a whistle around my neck. (laughs) I couldn't talk in my job. I mean, it was people I was, you know, writing notes to people and then people started writing notes back to me and I wrote, I can hear, I can't talk. (laughs) <laughs> you don't even talk to me. <laughs> you don't have to write me notes, you know. Anyway, so so in that in this process, I got remarried, and then I got divorced, and then um, I got remarried again, and it was it's a miracle that I ever graduated. But it took me, um, let's say, fourteen years to get my bachelor's degree. I'll still working full time. This is why I say anybody can do this. Uh, working full time. I took a year off and then my daughter graduated that year from Ohio State. And then I went back. And when I saw the master's program in English, it, there were no tests. It was all writing. And I went, oh, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> after, after 14 years of bachelor's, you know, I, I thought, oh, this is a piece of cake. Well, of course it wasn't, but it didn't <laughs> matter. It was something. And I only did this for me. I was in the corporate world. I didn't need an MBA, which is the track I started on and failed calculus. And when I failed calculus and I looked what was coming up, I went, oh no, this is not. not, So I changed my major to English and never looked back. And it's the best thing I ever did. Because if you're young and you go to college, you may declare a major, but once you go to college, your major could change 10 times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kept, I kept, I loved every class I took. So I don't think you are ever too old 
to start a business and I don't think you're ever too old to go to college. It's the most rewarding thing I ever did for myself. That's why I call it a triumph. We had a lot of deaths in our family during that time. I had a lot of stress. Yeah, my my first divorce, I was, um, yeah, I was dealing with my divorce. <laughs> so when I when I failed calculus, so I should have dropped it, but you don't, you don't, you don't want to ever drop a class. You just, you want to keep going. Mm-hmm. So I consider that triumphant only because it wasn't smooth sailing all the way through to get it. Not because you can't do it. It's just these things kept interfering in my life that, that were causing problems for me. But I'm, I was so proud of myself that I stuck with <clears> it and that, and I never regret the time I spent getting getting that degree. That's excellent. And I absolutely agree. I think oftentimes the challenges that lead up to, to our triumphs are what makes the triumph so much greater Yeah, is because we had to struggle to get there. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's excellent. And, and I can definitely relate to the whole changing majors things. I, I, <laughs> I started out as a nursing major and then went to physical therapy and then <laughs> ended up uh, in public health. Um, so yeah, I've had a few changes myself. <laughs> and that's okay. That's mm-hmm. perfectly okay. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I, you've talked, you know, throughout these questions as, as some of the things that you've had to juggle. So, you know, career, family, household responsibilities, illnesses and caregiving. Talk to us about how you maintain a work-life balance and what do you think employers could do to be more supportive? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing, I have worked for myself for 20 years. So when I was in when corporate, um, you know, it was you had your hours. <clears throat> They were every day when you had to be in the office. There was very little flexibility at that time. Very little. So when I, I started my own little business, it was called Insurance Resources. And I worked on major projects for insurance agencies because they didn't have staff to work on those projects or they'd have to take them off of something else. So before I was in the magazine business, I did this for two or three years and I was working from home. So I learned how to work from home. I got an office set up at home and I learned that I could never go back and work for someone else because of my flexibility. So employer, whether you're an employer or a sole proprietor or whatever you are, these are the rewards of having your own business is the flexibility. Uh, my, My daughter was, you know, grown by that time. So I didn't have to deal with that. I dealt with my two children at different times for daycare. And we had good daycare systems, so that wasn't an issue. That, not for me anyway, that was not an issue. It was expensive as daycare is. Daycare is very expensive. But the most important thing was the flexibility. And, you know, when you work from home, like I have been so many years, yeah, you can work more because you're right here and you can cook a meal, you can do laundry, but then you also can be working when you should be off the computer and not working anymore. So that's the new challenge, especially during COVID. The new challenge is get off the computer, stop working. At some point, your day has to end. Somewhere, your day has to end. So do we ever really have balance? I don't know. I don't know if we ever attain balance, but what we can do is shut off the computer, turn off the phone, put it away, get outside, do something, just stretching, walking away from the screen because we're probably all on screen so often and just do something different. Look at something different, sit outside and just try to change what you're doing. Definitely exercise. You've got to exercise. You uh, That is on my calendar. I have a personal trainer that I go to twice a week. I never miss them unless I'm sick or I'm at a women's conference that I can't, I don't want to miss. So I just go because if now you're accountable to a trainer, you're charged if you don't show up when you're late, <laughs> if you're late canceling. You get, so you want to be there unless you're really sick. They opened up in the middle of June. They were virtual when they shut down. So I was doing virtual workouts, which I, I hated myself. I just hated them myself. It mm-hmm. just, it didn't work for me, but 
So I went back as soon as he opened up, I went back and it was clean and you wore your mask and I found I can work out of my mask. It's no big deal. I can still breathe. And we're still wearing masks, still sanitizing. I sanitize before I go in and when I leave. He has not had one case of COVID. Everybody has been healthy and clean. He's done the right things. And you know what? These businesses don't want to close. They want you to come in. They want you to be safe. They do not want to close. So they're doing, he spent a lot of money in getting everything clean, HEPA air cleaners and all of that. So yeah, I think, I think you have to find your balance. The other thing you can't be afraid if you're working for someone, you can't be afraid that you're going to lose your job if you take time off. Do you know Americans are the worst in taking vacations? Because we're so terrified of losing our jobs. We don't take the time off we need. You need the vacation. You need to take the time off. And employers, even if it's just and at one person hiring a couple people, you've got to respect your people who work for you. You've got to respect them and let them take time off. Don't criticize people who take vacations. You need that mental health. Wherever you go, it doesn't matter if you stay in the state. If you go to a metro park, it doesn't really matter where you go. You need the downtime to not answer emails, to not answer the phone, and just take a break. That can bring balance into your life, and you just you need to do it. And if you can keep your mind quiet, you should meditate. That's the hardest thing mm-hmm. for me because my mind never shuts up. So I, I have to really work at it, and I'm constantly correcting my mind or rearranging my mind, as I like to say, I have to rearrange my mind every minute. So do something, do something other than work and to bring some balance into your life. And do choose that time to shut down and just get, leave it, stop. Just do something for yourself. Self-care is not selfish. Exactly. And I, I love that you mentioned meditation because that's something that I have found to be life-changing. I actually learned meditation from a meditation master um, about seven years ago. And, you know, with, with my ADD brain, you know, there's millions of thoughts in my head all the time, no matter what I had tried meditating countless times before. And I just, I could never make my mind quiet. I could never get the thoughts to slow down. I never experienced that, that state of inner peace that they tell you, you can get from meditation And I really wanted to meditate and I just couldn't do it. And I would get so frustrated because there's so many benefits to it. And I was always like, I need this so bad. Why can't I do it? And then I I was blessed with crossing paths with a meditation master and just applying one of, of his methods. I was able to stop every thought in my, in my mind in under three minutes. And I was blown away (laughs) and it is unbelievable how much bliss and joy just spontaneously wells up from within you. When you have a quiet mind, it is uh, remarkable. Yeah. And just so amazing for your mental health and just helping you to recharge and have better focus and attention and more inspiration on, on whatever it is that you're, that you're working on or that you're doing. I can't speak highly enough about the benefits of, of meditation in every aspect of your life. It's absolutely phenomenal. (laughs) So I I love that you mentioned that. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely, definitely to all of our listeners, you know, get online, you know, find a a meditation school or, or a meditation practitioner, you know, because especially if you, if you're like me and you've tried it before on your own and you couldn't, you just couldn't get it to work for you, seek out somebody that can, that can help you a meditation master or meditation school, something, because I promise it's worth it. (laughs) It has been my lifesaver. (laughs) For sure. So Barbara, how would you define success for yourself? And do you have any tips or habits that you use to help you be successful or to feel successful? Yeah, I think that that's really tough to define it because we usually define success as position, title, money, how much you're making, how much you saved, uh, the size of your home, 
your car. And I grew up with a father who grew up very poor. He left home at 13 because of an abusive father, lived with, lived with a pastor. He went into World War II. Just before I was born, he left. He shipped out for Germany. And so my mom came home. They were in Boston. My mom came home and lived with in Cleveland, lived with her mother-in-law until I was born. And then we made other arrangements. But I grew up with, a, with parents who believed you could do anything you wanted to do. It had nothing to do with the fact you were a girl, nothing whatsoever. My dad was just, he was so ahead of his time. He helped my mom in the house. He owned a landscaping business. So he worked very long hours. We didn't have dinners together. And if it was winter, he was doing snow plowing. So we would never had a family meal together, except maybe on a Sunday, but that was rare. But he, he taught us to be courageous. He taught us that we could do whatever we wanted to do. He taught us equality among men and women, which was a fallacy, but but I believed it because my mom helped him. She did gardening, she weeded. If he needed help, she'd go to the factories and water. I mean, it it was an amazing partnership. They had a community garden and they had just, oh my God, so much in the community garden. And they both worked it into their 80s. Oh, wow. My dad had died at 89. My mom lived to be 98. Wow. So, I mean, they worked hard and they, inst- and, and we were no longer poor. We were middle-class family. We certainly weren't poor, but my dad always lived as though we were still poor. So he was very careful about his money. But what I found out when I got married the first time was that the equality wasn't true. That was, that was in my household and that was my parents. That wasn't the reality. There was no help from my husband. There was no help with the children. There was no help whatsoever. That was my job. It didn't matter that I was working full-time too. That didn't matter. All the household things fell on me. Everything fell on me, everything. So I learned quickly, wow, okay. There's something else you need to, to learn is that Uh, If you're going to marry someone again, you want to make sure it's someone who believes in equality and believes in sharing responsibilities and not leaving it all up to the woman. Nobody ever said it was just the woman's work. I think it's joint work. However, you help each other and your partners. Not only are you husband and wife, but your partners in your life. So that was a rude awakening that I had to get and fought. I mean, when I got married, I was 20. I took obey out of my vows. I was 20 years old and I knew that I was not going to obey. And my father said to my husband, she never obeyed me. I don't know why you think she's going to (laughs) obey you. (laughs) It's not going to happen. And yes, I, I don't believe, I believe in love. I believe in support. I believe in that. I do not believe in obey. So. (laughs) Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now let's take a moment and if you would reflect on something that you wish you would have known sooner in life and share that with us. Yeah, I think, I think the most important thing is uh, when you're a young woman, I graduated from high school at 17 and started my first job in an office as a secretary. And I thought I needed a man in my life, always needed a man in my life to take to whether it's to take care of me, to love me, support me, whatever it was, I always felt I needed to have a man in my life. And honestly, it wasn't until I was about 40 that I realized I did not need a man in my life. I wanted a man in my life, but I didn't need a man. And the whole thing changed. The whole thing for me changed. Yeah, it took 20 years to figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) But better late than never. Absolutely. But, But I think... In the world that I grew up in, you got married. You pretty much were a secretary. You were a teacher or a nurse or a librarian. These were the opportunities that were available to you as a young woman. And of course, being married was like the first thing on the list or should be the first thing on your list. That's not true for young women today. That is just not true today. You can wait to be married. You can never get married. 
You can have children. You can never have children. It is your choice today what you want to do. I'm just glad that I found out <laughs> finally <laughs> that, yes, you can love them. You can live with them, but you don't need them. And, and, and when my husband passed away, yes, I needed him. I missed him. I wanted so much the life that we had because everything in my life changed because of that loss. But I didn't feel that need to find another man to replace him. If somebody comes along and it, it works out, yes, I, I would get married again. I'd have another relationship, but I don't need it. And that's not what I'm looking for. I'm in a different place in my life. And I think you can overcome, which was he was the best thing that ever happened to me because he let me be who I am, which was not obeying. <laughs> <laughs> Not obeying. And not all men can do that. Not mm -hmm. all men can let you be who you are and continue to be who you are. So I think that's, you know, you have to, you have to live up to who you are. You have to be who you are. You can't be who someone else wants. And you can't be someone else in order to make that person happy. Because in the long run, you will not be happy. I absolutely agree. And I, I love how you, you talk about not needing a man. And I think that is something that is so important for us as women to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that I've definitely learned over the years is I don't need a man. I, I spent many years thinking that I did. Yeah. And then, you know, one day I realized I don't need a man. I would like to have one around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't need one, you know, and really understanding that I can be fully self-sufficient on my own. I can do things on my own. I can support myself on my own, that, that I don't rely on somebody else for those things because, you know, they're not always going to be around stuff happens, you know, and I don't need my, my livelihood or my security dependent on somebody else that, you know, may not feel the same, the same way about me. So yeah, just, you know, I, I think that's great to, to realize that you don't need anybody else and, and to just be fully self-sufficient on your own, but that it is nice, you know, if the right person comes yeah. along yeah. to, to share that, you know, share, share a relationship with, or, or share your time and your energy and your emotions and your love with, but not needing them to fulfill something that it's not their place to fulfill, <laughs> you know, just to find that fulfillment within yourself, but be able to share in that love with somebody else. Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. So Barbara, what advice would you give to young women that are beginning their careers or, or women that are changing their careers? Know that you can change it. <laughs> know that you can. I was a secretary for many, many years and you know what? I loved it. I loved being a secretary. And of course it was all men at that time. There were no women executives, at least not in my area. It was all men, which was fine. And it was men who gave me the opportunity to not be a secretary, to advance to something else. So you could be in a position, but have the courage to ask for the opportunity to be something else within an organization. You don't have, you learn a lot as a secretary, you learn a lot about the business, about the product or the services that the company offers. So it's a good learning place. And if you're still a secretary today, I'm sorry, an admin, administrative assistant, whatever they're called today, there's nothing wrong with that. I loved it for many, many years, and I never regret what I learned from that position. And have the courage not only to ask for a promotion, ask for the opportunity perhaps to get into a different position, have the courage. And when I started my first little company, it's because I was downsized out of a corporation. I had never lost a job in my life. So I was reeling that this company thought they didn't need me anymore. And I thought, how could that possibly be? They need me. <laughs> so you, you recover from whether you're, you're let go for whatever reason, COVID or whatever else. So remember that it's never too late to start your own business. Never too late. When I bought into the magazine, I was 60 years old. That's when I got my master's degree. I turned 60, I got my master's degree in English, I bought the magazine, and those were huge changes in my life. 
first of all, I was out of school, which was a huge relief. I was out of school. Mm -hmm. I was so happy to be out of school. And, and then this opportunity came. It was an accident. When people ask me, how did I get into the publishing? It was a complete accident. I was president of the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, and a man on my board introduced me to his partner. Of course, we're all in the same business. She was starting a woman's magazine, and maybe I'd be interested in helping her or getting to know her. So we met, we immediately clicked, and then then I started helping her with the nonprofit organizations and they could get the word out. We donate advertising to them and get the word out about it. And so that's how we built our business was through the nonprofits. And then it was, uh, we were at some place together with a booth with the magazine. And I said, I can't do what I'm doing anymore. I'm bored. I'm restless. I need to make a career change. And she said, let's have dinner and let's talk about the magazine. So after dinner and a couple of bellinis, I bought into the magazine and I bought the Cleveland Women's Journal. And then when she retired, I took over the entire Cleveland Women's Journal. So it was an opportunity that came about that I wasn't looking for, but you have to be ready when an opportunity comes around. You have to be ready to think that's not impossible. My husband said, so what are the numbers? I said, oh my gosh, there are no numbers. It's the first year. There's no profit in the first year. With most small businesses, there is no profit. It's all going back into the business. And of course, when my dad got sick, definitely there was no profit in the first year. And I'm not sure what there was in the second year, but it wasn't much. But that's not the purpose. It's not about the money. You decide what your mission is. Our mission was to empower women through knowledge. And we stuck with that mission over all these years. The mission is the same. How we share the information has changed. What we look like has changed. It's published by women for women, and none of that has changed. So through all of this, yes, we're still standing, including uh, digital only now, instead of digital and print, because of COVID, we aren't printing right now. When we return, we have no idea. Lobbies are still closed. They don't want magazines in there. So it's, you know, it's, you. I'm giving you the advice to be courageous, whatever you're doing. Don't think something is impossible, because everything is impossible. Everything just... If that's something you love to do, and I thought, oh, I'm actually using my English degree <laughs> as editor. I'm using my English degree. That was not the reason I got it, and now I have it, and it has helped me in my my current position as editor. So, <laughs> so I just think, and when you're downsized out, sometimes you don't want to go back because you're in the same position that you were that you could downsized out again, or because of COVID, mm-hmm. there's still risk of losing that job. Think about what you can do or how you can start a business. A lot is changing and we're fighting for the rights of women business owners to get loans, which were denied us to get a loan many years ago. We were denied that opportunity only because we were women. No other reason except we were women. That's changed. Now we've asked for more access to capital so women can start businesses and get a business loan. Wow. Thank you so much for that advice and for the the courage to to strike out on your on your own yeah. like you did and and encouraging others to to summon that courage themselves. Yeah. Thank you. So Barbara, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you, how would they get in touch with you? My email is Barb Daniel, all one word, Barb Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L at S B cglobal.net. That's the best way to get in touch with me. Um, The website of the magazine is women's, W-O-M-E-N-S hyphen journal, J-O-U-R-N-A-L.com. Our digital magazine is on that website and information about our magazine. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Barbara, it has been an absolute privilege speaking with you and you've shared so much wonderful knowledge and experiences. I just want to thank you again so much for taking the time to to speak with us today. Thank you. I so enjoyed talking with you. On Technology Partners, would like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Women's Stars. If you'd like to appear on a future podcast episode, or if you'd like to nominate a businesswoman to be interviewed for Women's Stars, 
please email stars at ontechpartners.com. My name is Shanti Harkness. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you for joining us on today's journey. Remember, you are all women stars. If you wish to learn more about our Women Stars program or want to be a guest on our show, contact us at stars at ontechpartners.com. And thank you to On Technology Partners for helping me make this program a reality. Remember, we at On Technology Partners want to help you protect your team from hackers. To learn more about our cybersecurity services, go to ontechnologypartners.com.